Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to COEO's webinar on cloud communication challenges for the healthcare industry. I'm Eric Wentz, Chief Executive Officer and founder of COEO Solutions, a cloud-based communication and service provider specializing in security, SD-WAN, SIP trunking, and unified communication solutions. Our reason for co-hosting this webinar, along with Ribbon Communications and Advocate Aurora Health, is to talk about the evolving world of networking and communications for the healthcare industry. There are significant challenges in the healthcare industry that telecom can deeply impact to help solve problems created by regulatory changes, ongoing compliance needs, security, and performance requirements. I believe there are many more technology issues to cover that affect the healthcare than we have time to cover today. So we're gonna to try to focus the agenda on four key areas. The first one is healthcare communication trends, the importance of highly available voice data and, and security networks, technology challenges created by ongoing M&A in the healthcare industry, and how organizations have been able to evolve from legacy systems safely and cost effectively. But before we get started, I'd like to introduce our three featured speaker, speakers. Our first speaker will be Greg Zweig, the VP of Marketing at Ribbon Communications, and he'll speak on healthcare communication trends. Our next speaker will be Kevin Orfino, VP of Engineering and Operations at Coeo Solutions, and he'll speak on healthcare communication requirements and the need for high availability voice data and security. Our last speaker is Joe Tenuta, Vice President of Health Informatics and Engineering at Advocate Aurora Health. We're excited to have Joe speak with us as he's gone through a tremendous network upgrade from legacy single-threaded TDM infrastructure to a highly available, highly secure SIP trunking infrastructure that's producing wonderful results at hundreds of his locations. At the end of Joe's presentations, we'll conduct a quick open discussion. If at any time during this presentation you have a question, please add it in the chat session. And Brian Gregory from Ribbon will facilitate the Q&A at the end. I hope you find this webinar educational, insightful, and I thank all of you for joining. And so with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Greg from Ribbon uh, to talk about our first topic of healthcare communication trends. Greg, it's all yours. Thanks, Eric, appreciate it very much. And thanks everyone for joining us today. So I, I'm, Brian, if I could get you to head to the next slide. I think, uh, you know, we're lucky here at Ribbon. We're, we're very um, fortunate to have some of the largest uh, healthcare organizations in the country who are our customers in, uh, you know, in some of the biggest cities. And, and I've had a chance over a number of years to visit with, it, with a large number of them. And, you know, uh, particularly in the last few years, we've seen kind of an interesting change in how providers see their communications environment. And uh, I, I tried to sort of define it here on this slide. We, I think, and I'd be curious to hear as we get into the open session later, whether you all agree, but what we see is a big change where we have a number of providers of very traditional phone requirements, you know, have uh, they need to have the disposable room phones in the hospital they're still using things like fax uh, you know a lot of the calling is interdepartment it's not you're not calling to an individual you're calling to the person who's working on the third floor and the x-ray department things of that nature and those people are still using traditional hard phone devices and of course they're working in an office in the environment but at the same time, particularly since the pandemic, you know, we've seen a huge growth in, the, in cloud collaboration tools, right? And obviously these are for telemedicine, but, but I think more typically you see the kind of, I'll call it classic business collaboration environment where you have a administrator who wants to, you know, talk about budgets with their, with their coworkers and they wanna share a spreadsheet or a PowerPoint presentation. And a lot of those people are now in a position where they've learned to work hybrid. They're, they're at home maybe one or two days a week. Maybe they're mobile part of the time. 
and uh, they're operating off of clients like I am here today and, or mobile devices. So we have this kind of odd scenario where you have uh, you know, all this traditional telecom, but it's now being mixed with sort of the more modern cloud-based collaboration. And Brian, if I could get you to move to the next slide, I think part of the challenge there in this diagram, and I know it's a busy diagram, is that as that change has happened, we've seen a change in threat parameters. So if you look on the left, you see kind of what I think most healthcare environments look like five years ago, which is, hey, I had a PBX, maybe I had a contact center. It's all in one building or in a group of buildings. And basically, um, you know, I, I worried about what was happening outside of me and I tried to secure it, right? Which is I created a perimeter around myself and I knew that the people who operated inside of my environment were safe and the people who were outside of it I had to worry about. Now, if you look on the right-hand side, I think today what we see more and more is this kind of mix where we still have some people operating in that, that internal environment, but they're a subset, right? It, actually, what's happening is a lot of my, more of my users are remote, particularly contact center agents, but, but all the folks we talked about in the last slide. And then I have a mix of software. Some of it's my PBX might be running in that blue circle on the right, but my contact center software or my cloud collaboration software might be up in the cloud. So as a result of that, we see a lot more places where potentially people are trying to threaten the organization. You know, we have ransomware, uh, you know, trying to get uh, personal records, all the things that, that healthcare providers worry about. There's more places that you have to think about securing the solution. And so if you'd move to the next slide, Brian. So at Riven, what we've seen is really that the summary is there's a tremendous need to integrate all these disparate elements and secure them. Right, so what, what we see happening, and I think what Joe and, and Kevin will talk about is this really, this need to be able to bring together the legacy pieces and the new pieces and create a contiguous environment. It needs to be cloud and premise. It needs to be vendor agnostic. Uh, you know, it needs to be transparent to employees and to patients. Uh, you know, probably most of the folks on the phone, certainly us, we're all technologists. But for the everyday employee at, in a healthcare environment, they don't want to know how the phone system is put together. They want to dial an extension and get the person. They don't care what system they're connected to, right? Uh, so all of those things have to happen. And then it needs to be incredibly reliable because you're in a healthcare environment and it needs to be incredibly secure. And, uh, you know, that's what we focus on today at Ribbon. And I think as you hear, you'll, you'll hear that's what the COYO team focuses on and, and what's important to Joe. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin to talk a little bit about um, some of the challenges and solutions that, that he's seen in the space from a COYO perspective. Hey, thanks, Greg. Uh, welcome, guys. I'm, I'm Kevin Orfino, uh, Vice President of Engineering at uh, COYO Solutions. And as Greg alluded, I'm going to talk about a few of the the high level challenges that are facing healthcare organizations across the, across the US and really the world. Um, you know, with the pandemic, right, I don't think anyone has, has not been scrambling around trying to find a, a work from home, work from anywhere type solution or increasing their presence in cloud applications such as contact centers or, you know, Microsoft Teams for Zoom and, uh, or Zoom calls and things like that. Um, and, and what happens with those, right, especially from a healthcare perspective, we saw this at Advocate, right? We needed to act quickly. We didn't have time to, to waste. Um, there were, you know, temporary locations being set up for, um, for patients to get tested for COVID. And, and those things required, you know, really si significant time to, to, to put behind what that solution should look like. And, you know, some got it right and some didn't. So those are challenges that um, I, I think we got it right with, with Advocate for sure. Um, but there are, those are challenges that folks um, were, weren't lucky enough to have that. And so they have things that were maybe half-baked or um, not fully vetted that uh, they're still trying to, to bring those things um, into, into the mix. Um, with that, right, we talk about uptime. Uh, from a healthcare perspective, um, you know, making phone calls and having a, 
uh, a call fail is just not an option, right? We, we need to be able to talk, uh, patients need to be able to call in to the service providers in, um, in conversely between, between the healthcare organization and itself. They need to be able to reliably talk and uh, have applications and have images sent and things like this. So uptime is a huge challenge that we're always facing. And, and as we add these different um, islands, if you will, think about all the people working from home or just simply new islands that are out there that now those IT organizations have to address, right? And, and, and make sure things are secure. So we, we increase our, our attack surface. So, you know, Greg was talking about these bad actors and these ransomware attacks, it's just exposing more out there for folks that want to cause havoc and you know, we need stronger protections, right? So these are things that uh, are, are definitely on the agendas that uh, we see people asking us um, on a daily basis, right? And then as he also alluded to the legacy systems and the integration, I'll talk more about that in the M&A space, but then the biggest one for everyone is cost, right? So you know, I was playing golf with a finance guy from a large medical supplier here in Columbus, Ohio. And he said, yeah, I can't believe it. You know, pre-pandemic, a shipping container costs $2,000. Today, it's $25,000. And, you know, I thought I heard him wrong. Um, I didn't. I got it verified by two other people. And it's just incredible. So they can't take that cost and pass it along to uh, the downstream consumer, which is you and I, which is great. However, um, you know, the businesses are being hit with that. And Joe, Joe can allude to, to these in, in his in his talk as well. But that's something that, you know, they start, we start looking at other areas and telecom expenses is typically a, a large piece of any business that's, uh, that's operating successfully. So that's always a, a target place. So um, you can go to the next slide, Brian. So what, what I broke down here is really three areas of tackling most of these challenges, right? And, and as Eric said, there's plenty of uh, other opportunities and challenges that are out there and different solutions, but these are the three main uh, high level uh, areas for solutions, right? So we talk about redundancies, organizations are bringing in uh, different providers for your bandwidth and your data connections. And so you have, uh, three different providers say, and now you have three different support organizations and three different contacts that you have to work on, three different bills. And so there's plenty of, of uh, overhead that's being wasted there. So what, what folks are looking for is aggregate carriers that can actually bring in that same underlying carrier, but as an aggregate. And so you source down to a single, single point of contact for all of your support and billing to save you money in the long run and save you headaches, right? So these are these are things that we see and we, we do on a daily basis. And then in terms of our uh, SD-WAN offering, we, we have an SD-WAN uh, offering using Versa technologies. And this helps us attack some of those uh, challenges with uh, visibility into your network, right? Providing you some orchestration, some monitoring analytics that you just didn't have before at a layer seven uh, perspective so that you can you can find out if people are chewing up your bandwidth doing YouTube uh, videos and, and downloading those types of things. And you can steer that correctly down the right path and, and leave bandwidth for your critical applications, such as voice, right? Um, another thing it does, it, get, it provides you site security, site to site encryption. So that's security for HIPAA and all the other um, certifications that we need to abide to um, are it's just in, inherently part of that solution. Um, another key benefit from an SD-WAN solution is you take these aggregate benefits, you take these aggregate uh, circuits that are coming into an enterprise, and the most likelihood of the failure is at that circuit level. So in, in most businesses, they can take a hit and the calls can drop and they can re-originate and the call will complete to another over another circuit. And that's fine for a lot of businesses, but for healthcare, just can't happen right we've got to keep that call up and so whether you're doing bgp or some routing higher level routing protocols to help with that or you can use an sd-wan solution to help you combat that so your voice can stay up so if calls are coming over circuit a and that takes a fiber hit the call will stay up and we'll send the packets with an old an sd-wan overlay over circuit two or circuit three and nobody loses voice path which is which is what what it needs to be and then 
as we start to talk down at the third level is the session board controller space, right? And this is where Ribbon comes into play. They, they provide, you know, carrier class SBCs and routing technology that every carrier in the world is using. And, and we're no different. And we've taken that and we've pushed it down into the healthcare uh, industry. And, and, and this is what um, allows Joe and his team at Advocate to be successful, put everything into their uh, control that can be under control. We're doing secure voice. We're doing an HA architecture. If, you, if calls are off on one SBC and there's a hardware failure, all the calls transfer over to the backup SBC and there's zero calls dropped. Up to 100,000 calls have been tested and they fail over seamlessly, which is just incredible. And then you have your centralized routing policies and the ability to bring in and connect disparate PBXs and systems um, is just a, it, it's, I can't describe how awesome it is when you can bring in that type of a solution for a company like Advocate, Advocate Aurora Health that has a couple of different, um, you know, locations and different things that they want to connect to, such as different contact centers and UCAS solutions that are dispersed through different departments. It's just, it's just beautiful to be able to, to seamlessly walk in and provide a solution for that type of an environment. Next slide here, Brian. And then really, I look at the M&A landscape is really just all those challenges that you're facing is really just escalated, you know, tenfold, right? It's, you know, it's those challenges on steroids. So, it, you know, you just imagine if companies are coming together that have the same, or they have different technology. So you may have, and I'll buy a PBX, and I'll tell PBX, a loose PBX, a call manager. Uh, some of them are all legacy, some of them are SIP enabled. And, and the biggest challenge is how do we bring these together underneath one umbrella and really um, utilize the, the, the benefits that SIP and the new technology provides to us, right? And so, you know, along with Ribbon's core um, SBCs, there are edge SBCs that are there that help with that legacy analog PRI handoffs, and it, it allows you to stage, at the end of the day, your strategic migration of bringing these companies together uh, very seamlessly and very, um, very much at your own pace, right? And that's been uh, one of the biggest things that I think we've seen, uh, even at Advocate and other health uh, healthcare um, provider, uh, healthcare enterprises throughout the country, right? So I think that is um, the biggest, you know, challenge that these, the, the companies have. Um, and I think, I think we were talking about this the other day, what really makes us all work is really the partnerships, right? And so we look at, uh, obviously, Advocate's a, a customer of Coio, but they're also a partner and we're their partner. And, and we have a great partnership with Ribbon. And I think that that is, you know, really what gets us through these types of solutions that are, are needed for today's you know healthcare industry to stay up and uh and, and fully operational um 100 of the time so you know with, with all that said about partnerships i can't imagine a, you know a better partner to, to, to showcase and, and to be proud of what we've done there and and, and uh excited to hear joe talk about uh, all the things that we did with them and without further ado i just want to introduce uh from Advocate of our Health, uh, Joe, Joe Tenuta. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you uh, to Ribbon and Coil for the invite. Um, kind of caught me off guard, but uh, ready to prepare. They gave me some time to, to make sure that what we had was going to resonate with those that were going to be participating today. So I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I wear three different hats for the system. Uh, I do the video technology, also the network engineering. Um, but as it pertains to today's content, we'll be talking about the network voice infrastructure uh, and what we've taken. Um, it's been quite the journey. I think a lot of people initially thought it was a little crazy, like, why would you do this? The phones work fine. It's 100-year-old technology. Um, and then I got some stern warnings from really technical people, which was, man, if this doesn't work, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. So um, it, it was it was tough those first couple of uh, months that we tried to convince people that this was the journey we wanted to make internally. But once we got that buy-in, um, you know, we went through a, a vetting process, both from an equipment 
perspective, but also from a carrier perspective. So hopefully I can cover all that today um, and raise and spark some curiosity. Um, so I'm really happy to, to be here to, to mingle with, with all of you. Um, so put together some quick slides. Um, I'm certainly not a PowerPoint by death, but I'm gonna cover these high level and really get into the, the nuts and bolts uh, here shortly. But some of the business drivers that we looked at was we really wanted to leverage new technologies for a number of different reasons. We made a, a very sizable investment um, before I even got to Advocate and then through the 11 years that I've been there in our VoIP infrastructure. And it just seemed a little, you know, kludgy that we just kind of ignored the carrier space um, and really didn't focus in on that at all. So there was curiosity there, you know, what what SIP look like? Can we do this fun stuff that everybody keeps talking about? Um, certainly security is always top of mind now more than ever, but back then, you know, TLS encryption, secure RTP, absolutely things that were being pushed upon me by our security uh, director and our CISO at the time, who also happened to be my boss, um, to say, you know, what can we do, you know, if we went to this model? Um, when we looked at the hardware, um, one of the things that really came to light when we started planning architecture was, you know, embedded firewalls. Um, and if it met the criteria of someone who's real pain in the butt for me, which is my peer and the director of security side. And he said, you know, look, I really like what the, at the time it was Sonus, um, what the ribbon product has. Um, and I'll have a funny story to share um, with that, that his engineers did not pass the, the, their first round of uh, security training to be a certified engineer on the product, which made me laugh a little bit. So I said, you know, Tell, you know, tell that to your Palo Alto folks, um, you know, that it's a pretty darn good product. Um, but um, I still razz them to this day. Um, and then we wanted to look at ways in which we could start to look at SD-WAN, SD-WAN offerings. Um, how do we leverage um, those, that same infrastructure to route voice traffic over, right? Um, and then the thing that um, maybe wasn't an initial driver, but is absolutely a driver now is TDM trunking conversion. So I don't mean the traditional PRIs, but I'm talking about POTS lines, I'm talking about alarm lines, I'm talking about fax lines that I, I don't know if you guys are getting the warnings I'm getting, but they're insisting that the uh, tariffs are going to take place, they're gonna start hitting us hard. Um, and I said, okay, so how do you want me to remediate it? And they offered me about four pieces of equipment at the tail end of a, of a SIP trunk to do media conversion. I said, well, that's cool, but we can do it with a single card that we're gonna add to our session border controller and just have a much cleaner you know, cut process. So along with that came some additional cost savings that weren't in our initial uh, estimates. Um, so that, that's been fun, it's a pain in the butt, but it's, it's a great journey to be on because you're, you're now fully leveraging that initial investment that you made. Um, from a flexibility perspective, you know, we're call control freaks. We're getting requests all day long for number portability, right, type concerns. I, sorry, I know it's a 20,000 DID, you know, call range, but I need this number. It's an important number and it's not going to point somewhere else, which is typically a contact center um, solution. So you're breaking up what was a homogeneous dial plan. And in the old days in a PRI world where you might port from carrier A to carrier B, that's a problem. That takes time. It's often not nimble enough or quick enough for uh, us to meet the demands of the business. By being able to stabilize that on SIP and then literally placing a ticket with our, our chosen vendor here in Coio and saying, yeah, we're not gonna bring that in internally to our own network, but that's actually gonna point to our cloud contact center solution. And we'll get into that peering uh, relationship there. Um, and then uh, the flexibility of being able to on a fly, change our business continuity and disaster recovery models. They're pretty static, but from time to time, we do have to make changes, um, especially in this day and age where most buildings that we occupy that are not medical centers, they're shadows and ghosts of what they used to be. So we are changing modeling uh, pretty much on the fly. Um, and again, uh, with the hardware that's in place today and the technology that's available to us, we're not waiting on a carrier, we're not. So that's, that's been absolutely crucial to our success. Um, next slide, please, Brian. Um, 
So some of the selfish things that we wanted as if the prior slides weren't selfish enough was the self-supportability and to be able to scale whenever we needed to. Um, and I think Kevin will attest to this, but we don't have a whole lot of carrier involvement today. Um, the model when I took over um, the telecommunications piece 11 years ago, we were completely reliant on what can and can't be done based on archaic rules, archaic processes, and something that I like to call as the black hole. Put the request in and you wait. I couldn't give any ETAs. We couldn't provide any kind of strong customer support. And uh, that weighted heavily on us, right? Um, I have a very caring team of engineers that we don't want to be sitting on waiting on requests for 30 days or longer. Um, and then we want the, the ability, uh, in addition to that, to quickly add capacity uh, or maneuver capacity as need be, right? That's this whole centralized SIP uh, diagram that we'll show you here shortly. Um, hopefully we'll be able to show you how well we can scale and move things around. So by adding capacity and being able to um, pretty much dial up the WIC whenever we needed to with a pretty quick operational change on our end and or some involvement from COEO. Um, so we're not completely independent of them, um, but um, that, that, that was key, right? To, to be able to deliver the demands of healthcare um, pretty much immediately. Uh, the economics, while I didn't originally know if the ROI, you know, was gonna really bet out. What we found was that, and we purchased the equipment, right? So we didn't lease, we didn't do a holistic cloud approach. We have very robust data centers in which we wanted to leverage. Um, the way that they're uh, powered, the way that they're managed and engineered, um, we light our own direct fiber um, into them. We felt it was robust enough that we can build this internally and manage it like our own little carrier network. Um, so that ROI actually wind up paying itself um, true in roughly 16 months. I, so I double checked my numbers last night. Um, originally we had proposed a 36 month ROI on the original investment of the data center session border controllers and then those that were uh, local there to our hospital campus uh, campuses. Um, the telecommunication savings, um, again, we, we we'll talk about this in a later slide, but much to my chagrin, we 25% and a minimum savings on that initial um, turnout. And that turnout, that project really was scoped around the hospitals. We didn't touch our clinics. We didn't touch our tier two sites. That number is specifically for the hospitals. As we started to look at TDM replacement, narrow band circuits, right, POTS lines, things of that nature, and then hitting our SD-WAN environment into our clinics, that number is probably overall closer to 40%. So we had a voice spend in the state of Illinois alone, um, mostly with one carrier in excess of double digit figures, 10 plus million. Um, huge amount of trunks, huge amount of traffic. We overbuilt, right? I'm sure some of you that are in healthcare today, um, when census is high and you're gonna get into that fourth or fifth PRI, most of the time it's dormant, right? We, we could see that in traffic studies. So we took that into account when we rebuilt um, the voice network. Um, it allowed us a chance to clean up our inventories. Again, not the fun, most fun process. And those people deserve many meals and many drinks on the house because of the efforts that they had to, to do to scrub CSRs and make sure that, you know, we're, we're moving numbers that needed to be moved as opposed to numbers that were there and nobody really knew what they were uh, pointed towards. So a lot of cleanup. Um, again, you're going to get a substantial reduction in unused services as well. And then the chance to finally get least cost routing capabilities. Um, recently, we implemented a management layer over our session border controllers, and I'm sure it's more than a management layer. I don't have my propeller hat on, so forgive me, but our, um, you know, our PSX EMS environment, um, which we turned up in 22, we started it last year, it's been turned up this year, provides us the chance to to provide least cost routing more than what just the PBX has allowed us to do, right? So in the state of Wisconsin, I've got everything. I've got Avaya Red, I've got Nortel Blue, we've got Cisco, we've got Elcatel, we've Vodabi. I can name some wing dingers from the 1990s that some of you would just cringe at knowing that we have the inventory there. Regardless, my point in that is that I can't do any least cost routing there um, unless we had some type of system that said, hey, look, that's in our dial plan, that should not go out. 
you know, through the public service telephone network. So that's our goal. We've been doing it now, uh, I think, Craig, it's been three months, four months, um, but, um, you know, obviously the more mature environment is, is able to leverage the SIP infrastructure and we're working uh, towards that. So um, that's been fun. That, that's, I don't even have a number as to what that could potentially save us um, from providing that, that layer of internal call control. Uh, Brian, next slide. So how we did it, um, and this is just a chalkboard sketch. We didn't want to get too uh, in the details. We certainly can if anybody wants to take a deeper dive later on or through the Q&A. Um, so what we asked of um, the many organizations, carriers, is how would you deliver this? Talk to me around geographic redundancy. Talk to me about carrier redundancy. I didn't want a single threaded you know, fiber to touch another fiber if it was part of a, an HA environment. And we did that. So we, we leveraged the Chicago Oak Brook um, location as a you know, primary, secondary, de depending on what month it is, right, when we rotate. And then we used their data center uh, colo in Denver to be the secondary source. That comes into one of three data centers. Um, initially it was two, um, and that funded all of the efforts for Illinois. And then as we now start to build the same model in Wisconsin, we now have one in our Northern Wisconsin data center um, to funnel SIP services to the hospital campuses and more. But traditionally we go after the hospital campuses first. Um, so we have um, the data underlay has, has redundancy. So it's, we're not using, you know, any particular data vendor more than for one one leg of that delivery model. Um, in each of these data centers, we went with a 5410 series box um, and they are configured in an HA environment. So if A fails, B takes over, vice versa. Um, if there is, um, again, the data underlay, we have that redundancy built in where from A it'll go to B. In the worst case scenario where for whatever reason the data center becomes an island and I don't have connectivity to it, uh, we can actually reroute on any one of the other two data centers in the same fashion. So we'll still have HA pairs in each of those with carrier redundancy. Um, I think we're slowly getting there in Wisconsin, but the hardware is there, the licensing there's the concurrent SIP call paths are there. Um, so what we did when we built that centralized SIP model, so it delivers into these data centers from there, it leverages either a dark fiber network or a multiple WAN connectivities back out to our major campuses. And what that allowed us to do was to say, look, all this overage, all this waste that we built into the PRI infrastructure out at the individual sites, it, it's, we didn't build it for that. We built it for, I thought was a worst case scenario. We're not even, we haven't even maxed out from some of our initial trunk projections. So we built those concurrent paths to be able to, to route down any one of those sequences um, back to the sites. In the event that um, you know, we need overages and whatnot, we were able to play around with round robin. We did percentage-wise percentage uh, distribution over the network if we need to, to avoid capacity issues. And Kevin was instrumental. I think he had to drop off the call, but he was instrumental at being able to help us determine you know, what made the best sense from a and it's not really a DRBC, probably more of a business continuity perspective, but if we were to ever hit a high census of phone calls for whatever reason through this infrastructure, we've yet to see it, um, knock on wood, you know, we've yet to see any failure in the six years that it's been up and running. Um, and that's not to say we haven't had a failure, the user never noticed, not a single drop call. Um, now, um, we did build in some redundancy out at the sites. So if the site, for whatever reason, um, became an island, um, and it, it, it has happened, and has no longer connectivity to the overall dial plan that's being presented by one of the three data centers, we, we have BGPR uh, in place, just like we do for you know, distributed um, uh, traffic between the three data centers. We call it a fourth route, call it a third route, whatever you want to call it, we actually have a dedicated um, you know, circuit. So we use an SD-WAN type connection back into a localized SBC. It's a much smaller SBC because it only cares about trunking that unique hospital's uh, needs and, and requirements. 
um, that's trunked at about 75% of what the original numbers of, of trunks that we had there. Again, we've used it a couple times. It's ha it has happened. Um, we do have to reestablish calls when that happens, um, but those those are done in less than three seconds. We've tested it, um, both unplanned and planned. Um, so we had a, an, a case where a fiber spur, um, there was a fire in the city of Illinois that cut the aerial fiber that was also uh, spurred to Illinois Masonic. So Masonic within three seconds was back up and running. Yes, we lost those calls that were active, um, but again, they were up in three seconds. Dial tone out, dial tone in. So then dial plan redistributed itself to the 2Ks on site. Um, what's great about that is that 2K was built um, on the layer two network that the VoIP PBX system is on. So we have our own little mini network there that was designed in that um, if we lost IP services to the phone system, our digital and analog phones still work throughout the campus, right? So we take it very seriously from an overall design perspective. Um, so that's internal to uh, Advocate Aurora's infrastructure. There are some external factors and um, COEO was chosen uh, with, through Avtex as well as uh, Genesis and our nice and contact contact centers. Um, we have different flavors after the merger, right? We haven't gotten down to one, but they are the chosen uh, carrier for um, not only Avtex as a as an integrator to Genesis, but by Genesis as well as Nice and Contact, and we actually trunk in peer. It's a bring your own provider um, in the cloud. So again, we didn't have to give up number, you know, any of our dial plan, uh, number portability, not an issue. Simply just some programming changes, obviously, uh, on Coio's side to be able to peer directly into them, which has been phenomenal for us. Um, I can't tell you how much of a help that was during COVID. Um, yeah, it, it blew our minds that we were able to do what we were able to do. Um, and it kind of, it's it's taken for granted, right? It's a phone, it, pick it up, it should ring, it should work. Kind of like your light switch, right? It's a standard utility. So, um, you know, much, much, much kudos there. Um, again, I don't want to spend too much time on, on trying to explain what we did or how we did it, but, um, I, Brian, if we go to the last slide, um, well, we could certainly take deeper dives uh, depending on the questions that come through. So outcomes and lessons learned, we significantly exceeded the original ROI projections. I talked about that. Um, again, we chose to buy our gear. We manage it. We have in-house engineers, heavy training, hard training. I, we talked about our security experts failing the, the firewall portions the first time they took them. Um, and, and we sustained that um, uh, level of training. We exceeded our initial cost savings projections um, and we continue to just drive down our telecommunications costs. Um, you know, I'm not gonna share our SIP costs compared to PRIs or, or POTS lines, but I'm sure you could quickly do the math and realize how much savings there are there. Um, probably the biggest thing that our auditors and, and, and risk and network security appreciate about is the impermeable service delivery model uh, where we, you know, Knock on wood again, um, my on call for engineering, network and telecom engineering in Illinois is it's usually about the network and not about this voice SIP infrastructure, um, sadly. <laughs> but it, it's been fantastic. Um, our DR plans, when we test every single year, it's an independent auditing uh, control faction within HIT. Um, at Advocate Aurora, and we fail with, or we pass with flying colors. Um, the quick and nimble internal ser service delivery model has been a godsend. Um, I can't tell you the amount of tickets, the reduction in tickets that have to be generated to a carrier, and again, the waiting time that it used to take to process some of these changes has been exponentially reduced to almost nothing. We can make changes on the fly without any disruption whatsoever. Um, and in a very quick commitment time frame. Um, one of the interesting things has been our temp costs actually went down. So we just renewed our telecommunication expense management uh, contract. And not only did it reduce, it reduced while adding the state of Wisconsin into the mix. Um, and that is largely because the complex billing um, of circuits in the old days, comparative to the way we have things set up today with our partner, 
uh, in Collaborator is it's been a godsend. So they're not touching the, the amount of paperwork and the amount of billing inquiries that were once kind of pervasive, right? And, and they're still there because there's still plenty of work to do. We are not anywhere close to, to finalizing this model and particularly the state of Wisconsin. It's a little bit of the wild, wild west. Had no idea there were as many carriers there. Um, so I'm quickly learning that, especially comparative to the Chicagoland area. Um, and you know, take your time um, as you go down this road to look at the, the, the carrier offerings, look at the equipment offerings. We looked at three different products. Um, you know, obviously Sonus, uh, uh, Sonus Ribbon was um, the one we chose, but we did look at other products um, and we went with what we felt was best to breed. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I'm on the presentation, but you know, they've been a tremendous partner to, to us and um, as has Coeo, right? Find the right, find the right carrier um, and find the right SBC that works for you and your organization. It's been fantastic for us. Um, again, we're fairly self-sufficient, but you know, there's still a big job that has to be done for Coeo and Ribbon to deliver, you know, top quality products and services so that we can look real good to our customers. Um, and then, you know, my last little note there is I wish I wish we would have done it sooner. And I and we certainly can't do it fast enough in the state of Wisconsin with some of the uh, uh, quick hitting tariffs uh, that are coming our way. So uh, with that, um, I think we open it to Q&A. Um, and uh, again, I'm appreciative of being able to, uh, to take the time to talk to, to you all and, and to the panelists here. Um, thank you. Joe, <clears throat> thank you very much for sharing your story. And I must say it's been a pleasure on the COEO side to watch you go through uh, your transformation from the, you know, old way you're doing business on the TDM side and then moving into the, the SIP side with all the different type of challenges and changes and, and what it's actually meant to you and you actually your team and to the, uh, in, into your business. And so my first, my question I have to you is, is um, from those changes in the migration and transformation, what is the greatest benefit to you and your team that you've experienced from making this change? You know, it's, I, I got to go to service delivery first. There, there's probably four or five. I, I don't know that I could necessarily say one's more important than the other, but because we're, you know, in healthcare and these are, you know, voice services into hospitals and surgery centers, it's got to be the uptime. I, I, you know, it, delivering that a secure, safe environment to the level that we've been able to deliver it specifically in the state of Illinois right now where things are mature and stable has been a godsend. Um, you know, I, I joke um, with uh, Dominica Tellerica, who she's a very high ranking senior vice president today in our organization. But at the time that I started, she was the president at Condell Medical Center. And the first four weeks that I was there, I saw her more than anybody else in the organization because we had wet, you know, uh, services underground cable and I could not keep those PRIs up. We couldn't. And they were going on, you know, bypass, which is a no-no, um, to Good Shepherd and other hospitals. And I, I thank her every time I see her. She's like, oh my God, here he comes again, you know, the crazy IT guy. And I said, you know, you kicked my butt enough where I actually did something about it. Right. I said, I this is not the way I want to, you know, extend my career with an advocate Aurora. Um, I keep getting invited to president's meetings and looking at our uh, nursing leaders, you know, with the promise that we're going to get better. And, we're, you know, I'm leaving it at the mercy of a very large, you know, phone company. Right. And then from the side, the last question I have is, is I think there's been a lot of regulatory change that's occurred with AT&T in the region as moving to SIP and, and changing your environment helped you mitigate any of the type of costs or issues or challenges with, with migrating or dealing with the incumbent uh, I like. Yeah, it's done a lot for us, right? So, it, you know, we talk about in most organizations um, for healthcare, safety is number one, but driving costs down is number two, right? And, and on any given day, depending on what the scenario is, they're going to outrank one another. Safety is always paramount, don't get me wrong, but looking at it from a financial perspective, we've got to cut costs. The demand is there. And the message we're getting not just from AT&T, but others, is pots lines are going to go up. We're going to tariff you. 
um, a lot of our other services, the older legacy services that I can't quite prune off of just yet because we don't have the equipment, we're now forcibly buying um, the SBCs, converting those trunks to SIP and saying, if you're going to threaten us, you know, we're going to take it into our own hands. We now know how to do it and do it very well. And we're buying those boxes, um, as you all know, and we're licensing them up. We do the ports. It becomes a SIP trunk and we do the media conversion in itself. So um, again, it's one of those reactionary things that I hate to be reactionary, but you know, we probably would have written some of those circuits out a little bit longer because we don't we don't have the time or the money to do some of this work. But you know, you start hurting the wallets of uh, large healthcare organizations. We have no choice but to respond. And I'll, I'll take the SIP concurrent call path price over a, a loaded uh, hot line price any day. Right. Thank you. And I think with that, what we want to do is is open it up to Q and A. Um, Brian Gregory, if you want to go ahead and um, take any type of questions from the uh, from the audience. Yeah, actually. Well, um, go ahead, Greg. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, uh, Eric. While we while we've been uh, while Joe has been talking, I was looking through a few of the questions. And a couple of good ones here that I kind of caught. One was, um, and you you sort of just touched on it. Uh, Joe, but I think it's the second part is probably worth it. Someone said, you know, what caused you to start this effort? And you, you, maybe you hit that. And then they asked, you know, did you have a kind of what was your process behind it? Sure. So it, there are a number of factors that went in into it. Um, you know, I'm not here to berate companies or, or what have you, but the time it took to repair, um, you know, a lot of the issues that we were having in our medical centers in the Chicagoland area was just ungodly bad. Um, and I didn't have another, we didn't, we didn't have a ton of solutions, but we had a, a robust VoIP system. So we started investigating what is SIP stable? Can we do this? It, it seemed kind of a silly question now comparative to back then, because, you know, it's the same IP discussion. Oh my God, can you go 100% IP? We don't, but that's by design. Um, we're pretty close. We're probably 80-20 if anybody wants to know. 80% IP and then some 20% digital analog depending on you know where you are within the hospital. Again, that's a localized DR type plan. Um, so it was a combination of really bad delivery service. Um, the pricing wasn't quite an issue back uh, you know when we started this. It is now. Um, and then just general curiosity and a lot of people um, did look at us like we were a little cuckoo, you know, it's the phone system. I mean, it's the phone network. It's been around for forever. Why would you want to change it? Um, in fact, our CIO and CTO just they pretty much told me it better be as, as good as what you have now, if not better, or we're going to be in trouble. And um, the process itself, um, we did an RFI. So we got some information from a handful of the carriers. Uh, we met with them many presentations with each one. There were four. Um, I don't know that it matters which ones, but you can at least guess one of them. Uh, AT&T was another one. Um, they've changed names since then, the other ones. Um, um, but really what, um, and, and we did the same thing from a, a hardware perspective, right? We talked to a lot of engineering um, uh, individuals out at um, companies like, you know, Sonus Ribbon. Um, that produced really, really good enterprise grade hardware. That's what we wanted, right? We wanted enterprise grade. Um, so we kind of knew what we went after. And it was probably nine months of discovery, six months of architecture and plan building, and then accumulating what the uh, initial investment was. Um, and then maybe another six months of waiting for approval from the board to, to, to get the funding. So probably two years from the, the start of the plan um and just conceptual because a lot of people thought i was crazy uh, but the engineers dug into it they were fantastic um to be able to you know kind of have the curiosity to start digging deep with with the likes of kevin orofino and, and the other technical bodies uh within companies like coeo hey uh, here's another i thought just a quick question but might be illustrative which is someone asked does this include the local medical arts buildings or is it just the the um kind of the hospital properties? Yeah, so um, it depends. So in the state of Illinois, we're very mature. So all our tier one sites, so I would call those like our medical centers, our hospitals, um, all of our outpatient centers, if they're, if, if, the, 
if the building or the practice was also on that same campus, we just converted it. It made no sense. And now it's trickled out to all of our advocate medical group um, facilities. So Illinois is very, very mature. So it's pretty much extended into, I call them tier one, tier two, and then even our Downers Grove corporate office runs on this technology. It's vacant, <laughs> you know, even though it's a, a hoteling type um, location. I don't know if everyone's seeing the same thing, but we built this wonderful, hey, come back to work when you want and huddle rooms. And uh, yeah, most people would rather just stay home um, unless there was a larger meeting, right? So we, we've, we've trickled that down there. In Wisconsin, right now we're hitting the medical centers. Any new buildings, uh, we're hitting the medical centers, hospitals, and then surgery, outpatient, you know, the really critical campuses are the ones that are going to get the um, attention first. And then eventually we'll get back into the, the clinics and then MOBs, office buildings, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the same person asked another question, which is, you know, just how large, and I, I, I assume they're talking about how many seats or how many users does the whole uh, network support? I assume um, that's what they meant. Well, I don't know our license counts, but I will tell you that I have over 75,000 endpoints, um, which are active extensions within the state of Illinois. And we actually have um, just a little bit above that in the state of Wisconsin. That number is likely, I think we have 24,000 active ports on IP that is converting to SIP either in 22 or early 23. So in total, you know, I'd say somewhere between 75 and 100,000 users, um, active users, extensions within our voice uh, infrastructure. So I, I, don't, I don't know if that's large or I mean, you guys would have to tell me. I think that's big, but uh, maybe somebody else will think otherwise, but uh, it seems yeah. pretty good size to me. Um, and then uh, I'm conscious we're just about out of time, but I, I thought this was a good question. Somebody said, um, you know, when the pandemic hit, what did you start using for the collab tools? And then you kind of just mentioned it, so I'll extend that. I, I'm guessing what they meant was, you know, what are people using in these work from home or hybrid work environments? I'm, I'm speculating that that was kind of the source of the question. Yeah, so the first thing we did was we rerouted God knows how many trunks from our internal infrastructure to the cloud. So whether it was, you know, contact center solution A or contact center solution B, because we were already peered, directly, again, bring your own carrier kind of an environment. Um, we just swung those those DIDs and the, the necessary trunks. So they leveraged cell phone technology um, provided by those contact center solutions. So we were able to move them immediately off prem. For everybody else, um, for the for the short run, we ran IP DSC based, you know, standard cell phones out of our VoIP solution. We have since changed that because we're migrating to a VPN-less environment through Zscaler, and um, because Zscaler won't support <laughs> IP-based cell phones, um, well, Jabber in one unique instance, but you got to route through the internet, not through the cubes. But we'll get into that later if anybody's curious. Um, so we actually um, we do a direct Teams Power App plugin uh, provided by our, our VoIP infrastructure. Um, the other option for us would have been bring your own carrier, which Coeo could have done had we gone to Microsoft with that request. Instead, um, one of the few times that our friends at Microsoft didn't necessarily force me into buying a better, more expensive license, uh, we, we worked within uh, their app development team and have our own power app there that basically is just a plug-in soft phone client um, for users to use when they're off-prem. Um, and it's an external call that they want to either take or receive. We control, it's coeo trunking, so it's still our dial tone, it's still our DID, terminates to our voicemail enterprise system. Um, so regardless of whether it's a medical call and there's pertinent PII or PHI left on a voicemail, we're, we have complete control of it, right? We're not using cell phones, we're not using you know, exterior communication devices. We wanted to make it a part of the integral dial plan. Um, so those are some of the creative things that that we've been able to come up with um, forcibly through the pandemic. And I'm just curious now, this is the Greg question they added on, which is, you know, what, how do you think users have, uh, do they like that solution? Do you think it's been well adopted or well uh, well received? Um, you know, honestly, I, I don't know for certain. Um, I will tell you that usage 
reports continue to go up as we onboard more and more people. And that's always the number one way to, for me, uh, you know, to ex see how um, adoption has been, uh, you know, kind of accepted and embraced. Um, we've got 2,000 of our 7,500 um, non-clinical at-home workers already converted to it. So some will move from Jabber and other you know, mm -hmm. devices, et cetera. Um, so there, there'll be some number portability type concerns because we'll have to port from outgoing vendor to, to COEO where our main trucking is. Um, but things, that, that's just gonna take a little bit more time. Um, but it's, put it this way, in the nine months that we were baking this idea, Greg, every time our CIO had a, a webinar for all of our HIT team members, that, that question was asked every time, when can I make external phone calls from teams and or from some other kind of solution other than my cell phone. Right. So, you know, I don't I don't like being on the naughty list. So we we had to come up with something <laughs> creative. I think that's corporate America for you. Nobody wants to be part <laughs> of those questions. Um, hey, hey, Brian, I know we're just about out of time, and I've been uh, I, I wasn't watching the last group of questions. Has anything come in the last minute or two that we should catch? No, I think we we gathered it all up, Greg. Thanks. Okay, good. Okay, I think with that being said, I want to thank everyone for your participation and, and thank you very much to Joe Tenuta and our partners at Ribbon Communications. Um, I think we expect to uh, send out a real quick uh, email to everybody and please give us your opinions, your thoughts, your concerns, and if you want to have additional conversations, we'd love to have them with you. And with that being said, guys, everyone have a great day. Enjoy this incredible day in Chicago that's uh, unusually warm so thank you very much and we uh, thank you for your time okay right. well stay well everyone thanks eric thanks you